This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you so much for the kind uh, introduction, Julia. It's really a pleasure to be back here at Cornell. This is my third visit. And I have to say, it gets better every time, but it also gets colder every time. <laughs> so being um, uh, in Georgia, my winter coat is, is not, I think, of the right uh, caliber here. Um, but it's, it's really lovely. Um, I got to have a tour this morning of the Boyce Thompson Institute and enjoy the warmth of some of the, the um, uh, different plant growing areas. So um, I'm going to talk today about our work on medical ethnobotany as a discovery tool for identification of novel chemical scaffolds um, for the purpose of drug discovery. Um, my main interest is in anti-infective drug discovery, but we have also um, worked with collaborators in looking for new scaffolds to treat um, cancer and other viral targets other than our bacterial and fungal work. Um, you'll notice here our little logo, if anyone, if there are any chemists in the room, this is elagic acid. One of my first major projects was on elagic acid derivatives from, um, from Rubus species. So that's uh, how that came into being. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges that we have with antibiotic resistance. Um, I'll go over the ethnobotany as a key piece to the discovery toolkit. Um, ethnobotany has kind of waxed and waned over time. In the 80s and 90s, this was a very respected um, approach that was used widely, also supported through the National Cancer Institute, um, to, to um, collect and, and look for new potential sources of, of compounds to treat cancer, among other targets. Um, but we faced a, a downturn in interest and funding in the 90s, in the later 90s, and, and even uh, and from 2000 onward. And I feel like we're finally getting back to the place where people are starting to go back and, and realize that we, there's still a lot to discover from the plant world in terms of novel chemistry. Um, I'm gonna talk about how we have expanded this um, toolkit and then give you a few examples of discoveries in this arena. For, we'll talk about the Elmleaf Blackberry Project, our work with chestnut, pepper tree, and St. John's wort. And for any of you that um, attended my lecture last month of the Tant Gardens, I apologize for any slides that overlap, um, but I think we'll, we're taking a deeper dive into the science in this talk. Um, the, one of the major um, reasons that we're working on this area of, of infectious disease is because we're facing what is going to be known as the post-antibiotic era. So we had the heyday of, of classic antibiotic discovery starting in the 40s into the 50s um, with a lot of these metabolites from soil microbes. But we haven't had um, much innovation in terms of antibiotic discovery since then. A lot of the new antibiotics are actually just um, analogs of existing structural classes that have been released. And so we're facing a constant um, battle, a game of leapfrog with these bugs in our search um, for, for drugs that will continue to work. And so this is, sums it up, I think, quite well. So antibiotic resistance is not a, a new thing that, that you know, that has, that has reached the limelight. Alexander Fleming, not long after um, his uh, receipt of the Nobel Prize, um, put this statement out of the thoughtless person playing with penicillin treatment is morally responsible for the death of the man who succumbs to the infection. They knew from the very beginning that antibiotic resistance was going to be a major problem if we did not um, take care of them properly. Um, yesterday on, on Twitter, if any of you are on Twitter, I posted a, um, a screenshot from another scientist that's interested in antibiotic stewardship, and he had a screenshot um, from the website Alibaba. Are you guys familiar with Alibaba? Where the, you could buy, I mean, gram quantities of some of our major antibiotics that are used in human medicine, as well as some of these that are in veterinary medicine, you know, starting from 10 to 30 bucks online. And that is exceptionally disturbing that these are so easily accessible through international markets um, to get um, not only being used recklessly in a lot of um, veterinary um, practices in terms of growth promoters for animals, but also um, this kind of ease of access through other avenues as well. So in 2016, the, the, the British government put together a um, report, this is known as the O'Neill Report, based, because um, it was chaired by the economist Jim O'Neill. And one of the key findings of this report is that tackling antimicrobial resistance will require not only um, stronger um, attention to stewardship, but also an adequate supply of new drugs to um, beat resistance as it rises. 
Um, this is troubling because we've seen um, con a continuous rise in rates of resistance and our current estimates of the number of deaths globally from antimicrobial resistance are around 700,000. Many think that this is a very conservative estimate. It's anticipated to reach up to 10 million per year um, with current rates of resistance um, by the year 2050. Um, for the first time ever, the World Health Organization released a target list of pathogens to work on for human health. These, um, you'll note, are missing tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is, of course, still a very high priority um, for your discovery. They just kind of kept that in a separate class. But these are some of the, the key ones. The ones in purple we're working on in my lab, as well as the one in red. I'm going to focus mainly on our staphylococcal work, um, because that's where we have, I think, more um, data to present, but we are pursuing um, discovery pathways for some of the escape pathogens in our, in our own bacteriaceae, Pseudomonas, Staph, Acinobacter, and so on. Um, these gram-negative pathogens in particular are very difficult um, to treat because of issues with penetration of the outer membrane, and so we're also working on um, trying to find natural products from plants that maybe on their own aren't necessarily antimicrobial, but can actually potentiate or sensitize the bugs to existing lines of antibiotics. So it's kind of a re resistance modifying agent. So that's one of our main approaches that we're taking with these gram negatives right now. So the other troubling aspect to this whole crisis is that while we've seen rising rates of resistance, at the same time, um, we've faced a big discovery void um, starting in the 1990s. Um, we don't have any new registered classes of antibiotics since the late 1980s. And anytime you see in the news these new antibiotics, again, they're not really new, new. They're based on the same scaffolds, just slightly modified. So resistance is a constant problem. Um, it might work for a few years, and then again, we have resistance to that um, class again. Now, this also um, corresponded with a shift in the way that we look for our antibiotics. Um, we moved more further away from natural products. They were still doing some work with soil microbes and, and that kind of discovery for natural products, but not so heavily emphasized um, on, on plants and more focused on products of combinatorial chemistry. The idea during this period was if we can build large enough libraries of hundreds of thousands of compounds and screen them with our new you know, high throughput robotics um, programs, that surely something would hit. And does anybody know how many antibiotics came out of that um, initiative that was multi, multi millions of dollars? Zero, nothing. And a consequence of that is while we have this emphasis more towards synthetic approaches, which, you know, I love synthetic chemists, they are my friends, so don't take this as an affront if you're a synthetic chemist. Um, but one of, the, one of the, the dire consequences of this is we saw a, a, dr a drop in training of people that have that natural products expertise and that are taking this approach of looking to um, different sources of nature um, for these new products. Um, the other problem was that we kept rediscovering a lot of the same compounds from these different soil microbes. So here are some of the latest representatives of the novel antibacterial classes um, that were released more recently. One of these as recently as 2007, but again, these were discovered in the 1950s. Um, so we need to do better at discovery of new classes. Um, people are looking to a, a number of different natural sources, um, still screening the soil, and there's some innovative new techniques that have emerged where um, there are new types of growth chambers, these iChip devices that can be used to grow microbes in their native soil environment. There are folks that are working on marine organisms. They're going to um, remote areas of the planet, looking at um, extreme ecosystems, trying to identify perhaps other microbes um, in the marine environment or other larger organisms in the marine environment as sources of these compounds. Some are focusing on endophytes or uh, fungi that live within plants. Um, some are focusing on genome mining, going back to those original sources of antibiotics, some on animal proteins, right? So alligators, Komodo dragons, these have been kind of some of the interesting things that have popped out in the news. And then plants and fungi um, are also um, the area where we're particularly focused on. Now, it should come as no surprise, especially to this audience, that plants would be a rational uh, or reasonable um, place to look for new compounds. We have a long history 
of successful drug discovery from plants. And in fact, many of the, of the drugs that are in the, um, the, the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines were originally derived from plants and have um, since, since then we now synthesize or, or um, create these compounds through other mechanisms. Um, but I think there's a lot to be discovered here. We also know that there are around 28,000 medicinal plants that have been documented on Earth. Um, this is from the recent Q report. Um, I think current estimates for total species is somewhere around 400 and 450,000 um, species of plants known on Earth, but 28,000 of those have been documented for medicinal use. There are no formal numbers on how many plants have actually been thoroughly investigated or their potential um, bioactivity, but as far as the anti-infective field goes, I would say it's in the very low hundreds of ones that have been really looked at from a robust biological or, or chemical um, angle. So why do plants make these compounds? It's all about creation of secondary metabolites. Different tissues um, will engage in different biosynthetic pathways to create plants for the defense against um, microbial invasion or infection. Um, now, something that's interesting is that perhaps we know that with fungi, they can create compounds that actually kill other organisms, Plants can as well, but what we're finding in my work is that the signaling pathways um, between plant and, and, and pathogen, um, there might be a more intricate or interesting communication system there where perhaps they're not just killing these bugs but are actually um, preventing their own or interfering with microbial signaling systems. And that's where we get into quorum sensing inter interference, which is what I'll talk about in a bit. Um, other secondary metabolites are released to attract pollinators and seed dispersers. They're released to prevent other um, species from germinating within their, um, within their kind of grow zone. And then of course you have secondary metabolites that can be upregulated to prevent over foraging by um, animals. Now the other thing that I think was really interesting is in 2015, more attention also got placed on the role of plants in treating infectious disease with Dr. Yu Tu's um, received the Nobel Prize for her discovery of artemisinin. And what I love about this story is that it not only incorporated, um, it's not only a story about successful natural products work, but it's also a story about the use of ethnobotanical tools in that discovery process. So they had yield problems when they were um, working with Artemisia. They had yield problems with their active um, compounds. And she actually went back to this um, five century old text and looked up the traditional way that this was prepared to treat febrile illness. And in fact, it was not created during, you know, using standard lab mechanisms of an organic extraction or perhaps a hot aqueous extraction. Instead, it was, um, you know, wrung out in, in, in room temperature water. And indeed, they did get higher yields of their active agent that way. Um, so the other thing that's interesting, I think, from the artemisinin story is that now we have widespread artemisinin resistance, of course, because we isolated that one single compound from the plant um, and used it broadly. Um, I think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned from this and that when you look at some of these other studies that have actually tried whole plant therapy, you get some um, uh, restoration of activity against the malaria parasite. So there may be a role for all these other structurally similar um, derivatives that are kicked off through that biosynthetic pathway that may be together in unison, they can um, help beat resistance. And that's an area that we're very interested in when it comes to our anti-infective drugs. Are we actually doing a disservice by isolating and only trying to develop single molecules? Would it be better in some cases to actually work on development of refined and rich extracts that are rich in these um, uh, molecules, and some of which might have actually slightly less activity, but as a whole, um, work better together. And I'll give you an example of that with our elm leaf blackberry work. So our core research approach is we have kind of four angles to the lab. We do field work. Um, this summer I was working in the Mediterranean. We've done a lot of field work also in Albania and in Kosovo and the Balkans. We also collect in the southeast U.S. So we have plants that come from Florida um, and also from Georgia. And for those U.S. collections, we're relying primarily on historic records of Native American medical uses of, of these plants. Um, all of our specimens are deposited in our herbarium where, you know, you have um, taxonomic um, verification that what we field ID is correct, and those are um, stored there. We also have a phytochemistry lab, which is where we um, extract the compounds 
and um, to start creating our library. And then we have microbiology and cell culture. So all of this is, is kind of run under the umbrella of my research group. So in taking the ethnobotanical approach to drug discovery, again, we're starting with all of biological diversity, but we're using this important lens of ethnobotany to narrow down the field, even beyond these 28,000 known medicinal plants, focusing primarily on plants that are used to treat infectious and inflammatory disease. I'm especially interested in skin disease and in topical applications of plants because um, from a from a chemistry perspective, it's a lot easier to work with those because you don't have to worry as much about compound degradation as you would with um, uh, therapies that are taken um, internally or orally. Um, these are extracted and we work up um, standard you know, mass spec and NMR um, on these um, compounds. The other thing that's interesting I think about or unique about our collection is that we focus again in the Mediterranean basin the National Cancer Institute's um, large global collections they did on both plants and also marine sources did not include Europe or the Mediterranean. And so I could clearly say that of all of the collections that are out there for natural products, I think we have some unique species or a new, unique collection of species um, in this group. In the approach, we're using tools from anthropology um, and tools from um, ethnobotany we're actively interviewing people about how they're using plants. The places that we work are very remote, and um, oftentimes these people are reliant on um, knowledge of which plants to collect in the wild for both their food and medicine. For example, some of our work in the Balkans, um, they are um, isolated for about six months of the year with heavy snows, and so they have to actually grow um, or collect a lot, all of their food to last throughout the winter. They then also ferment a lot of these foods through lactic acid fermentation for long-term storage. Um, and potatoes are their major crop. Here we are in a participant observation of helping to plant potatoes with some of these ladies. We're also looking to old text as well. This is an example of a text from the 16th, uh, 16th century that um, included notes from a, a Dutch explorer um, traveling in, in South America. And this is the Brazilian pepper tree. It's one of the plants that we've been working on. So there are, when, when people ask me about how do I pick my field site, everyone assumes for some reason I just like to go to Italy for the wine, which is, you know, okay, it's not bad, but, and it's a beautiful place to work, but there is a scientific rationale behind, you know, why we're working in the Mediterranean. Um, it is one of the global hotspots for biodiversity. We have, um, uh, we have over 25,000 plants that are native to the Mediterranean basin, but 13,000 of those are endemic. Um, so there's, a, again, a nice opportunity for collecting a, a wide variety of biological diversity, which also then, of course, corresponds to chemical diversity in our drug discovery initiatives. Um, what else is interesting is that, you know, when you look at how people use plants in these areas, you have a relatively small geographic region, but you have multiple languages that are spoken. You have different cultures, different religions. And in fact, we found that even people that share the same um, ecosystem, um, this is from our, our, our paper in, in Nature Plants, we found that even people that share the same ecosystem, if they're from a different culture that have different linguistic customs and different um, customs for their daily life, they actually use those natural resources in very different ways. Um, and that's especially relevant to how they use some of these medicinal plants um, for day-to-day -day, um, medical care. So to undertake this research, we go through um, layers of prior informed consent with both village leaders and also individuals. We follow codes of ethics for this kind of work where you're again gathering um, information from people and how they use plants. And we also engage in access and benefit sharing. Um, this, uh, our work may or may not someday lead to great outcomes in terms of um, translational um, outcomes for medicine with lots of money. That's always the hope, right? That you can find a drug that gets developed um, but the reality is that most of these probably won't, um, that won't occur. So we really take a big emphasis on um, engaging in access and benefit sharing from the very get-go. So um, some of the things that we give back to communities are languages or, or books in the local language. Um, we run workshops. We also um, engage in a lot of uh, different exchange programs with the students. So in the field, we're collecting these plants. They're field dried and then shipped back to the lab where they're ground up with a mill and then extracted and, and, and following various um, procedures. Um, they might be extracted through organic extractions or boiling, or in some cases, we also try and follow the traditional means of extraction as well. 
Um, these are then um, the solvents then removed and we're working with these crude extracts um, in our initial screens. So each extract from different plant tissues may contain from several hundred to up to a thousand different um, small um, molecules. So our current library is now, we have over 1,200 um, extracts from um, plants and fungi. These, um, also we have a pre-fractionated library on top of that, on a large chunk of these. And I think what's nice is that these are also highly biologically diverse. We have 50, 51 orders, over 400 species, and they cover, um, I think, a good spectrum of, of, of plant diversity, um, which gives us a unique chance to then screen you know, not just 1,200 compounds, we're probably actually screening more in, you know, the scale of millions of compounds because each of these is so um, diverse and complex. So in, when we get to the microbiology lab, some of the classic ways that people have looked at the antibacterial potential of medicinal plants has been following our standard in the box thought line of we need things that kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria. And across the board in the literature, that's what you're going to find if you look for antibacterial activity of medicinal plants. You're going to see people that run these uh, microtiter broth assays, which is basically you have the, the bacteria growing in culture, and you look at optical density to see if your compounds um, block their growth or kill them. You also might see a lot of these disk diffusion assays where you basically have an auger dish with compound on a disk or compound in a well or extract in a well, and you look for zones of inhibition. This is, this is the standard of where um, a lot of work is done. We also do this, but I think what is important is we go a step beyond, because I think a lot of the, a lot of the, the rationale for why these plants are being used in traditional medicine is actually being missed this way. Um, it's very easy to, to dismiss a traditional medicine if you say, oh, this is used for a skin infection, but it doesn't kill any of the bacteria that we know of that cause skin infections, so this is just an old wives' tale. doesn't work is junk. And I think that's been the perspective a lot of scientists have taken in, in, in this process in the past. And so we're really trying to make a push to encourage people to think about other potential mechanisms, other pathways where these compounds might actually be working. So we're looking at um, pathways that are involved in recalcitrance of infections or long enduring chronic kind of wound infections. That's where biofilm comes into play. We're looking at um, Compounds that inhibit quorum sensing or bacterial communication. This is very important for um, virulence factor production that's responsible for tissue damage. Um, and we're also looking for resistance modification. Can um, these actually potentiate or resensitize other um, classic antibacterials? And lastly, there's also the host-directed impact. And this is an area that we haven't been working, but I'm hoping to find a strong immunologist collaborator in the future to take on this angle. Because we've been so focused on how does it interact with the bug, we, we don't often think about how does it actually interact with the host, um, which might provide some interesting insight for medicine. So in our approach for lead identification, we're starting with field work or literature review. We collect the plants, we go through taxonomic identification, we're collecting plant DNA to have these DNA barcoded and entered into international databases. We are um, processing the materials in the field and then going through this process of bioassay guided fractionation. So at each step, it's, you have something that's incredibly complex, we get a hit, we separate using chromatographic techniques, then go back, retest, and keep trying to refine and refine it. I just had another meeting about our chestnut project where we were getting so close to identifying the active compounds, and I was very disappointed to find that that one peak that we found and isolated in a large quantity um, on our PrEP LC actually turned out to be five compounds still. <laughs> and it's like every time you get closer and closer, it's just like the, the set of Russian dolls, there's something else there. Right, but that's kind of also the exciting part about this. It's not an easy approach, but there's a lot there to be discovered. Um, following bioassay guided fractionation, we um, um, also go to animal studies. We use a lot of mouse models. Um, we can also use um, Galeria melanella models, which are basically these insect models um, that you can use for looking at pathogenesis um, um, for some of these pathogens. 
So I'm gonna to focus today on Staph aureus um, because we have a couple of examples of different plants that interact with this particular pathogen. Um, to give you some background, Staphylococcus aureus is in the Firmicute um, division of, of microbes. It's a leading cause of bacteremia, sepsis, brain abscess, medical and plant device infections. Um, we have new drugs, again, new drugs that have been put out. They're not really new and if you talk to an infectious disease doctor, they don't always work. They work beautifully in a test tube, but when you're dealing with a live patient, these are incredibly difficult infections in some cases to treat, especially for medical, um, uh, medical device infections. Um, one thing of interest is one in three of you actually carry Staph aureus in your, in, your, in your nose, in your nares. Doesn't mean that you're going to become sick from this, but it could lead to potential for transmission to other people that are um, perhaps more immune compromised. Um, there are two different types of staph that play an important role in health. One is known as HA MRSA or healthcare associated MRSA, or that stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. This is a resistant um, lineage that is associated with infections of people that are already sick in the hospital, are there for surgery, or you know, have um, some sort of immune compromised state. Um, then there is community-associated MRSA, which is a new lineage that emerged um, in the past 15 to 20 years that um, allows this bug to actually get into very healthy individuals. And I'll talk more about that and how some of these plant compounds may play a role in that. So let's start with biofilm and this idea of intrinsic resistance. So biofilms can be either unimicrobial or polymicrobial. These occur um, in nature. If you've ever looked at a slimy rock in a stream, that's the slime is, is from a microbial biofilm. Um, these are advantageous to microbes because it provides them a safe haven and a place where they can kind of um, work cooperatively um, with each other. So it starts with um, initial uh, ad adhesion to a surface. They grow into these mushroom-like structures and through these channels that you can see here, that's where they exchange um, genetic information. So you have much higher um, rates of genetic exchange in these communities. They also um, release their waste products through those channels and also take up um, nutrients. Um, what's bad about the biofilm in terms of the human host is that these are incredibly difficult to clear. Um, once they're in that growth state, they also enter, enter into a slower metabolic rate. So they grow slower, antibiotics work on rapidly dividing cells. Um, it's also more difficult for the antibiotics to actually penetrate that polysaccharide matrix. It's also difficult for your immune system to clear um, that matrix as well. So let's go back to Italy. Um, this is from some of my work I started off doing as a graduate student, documenting how people in these rural villages were treating skin and soft tissue infections. So I got to go around and ask hundreds of people questions about what did they put on their skin for pustulant oozing wounds? I mean, it's a great conversation starter, right? It's like, so you remember that time you had that nasty abscess with all that stuff coming out? What did you do for that? Um, and I got a lot of really interesting responses, everything from using slug slime to, you know, lots of different plants and even some different um, industrial chemicals used in agriculture. I was like, that sounds like it'd be painful. Um, but this is one of those that popped up. And what was interesting is that the, they would actually take the leaves and layer it with um, some um, aged pork fat on the skin. And they were also using the roots to treat hair loss. And this is basically a large briar patch, so it's not easy to go in and collect. Um, they also use the fruits in, as an edible for, for marmalades. So we had, um, there were over 116 different remedies related to skin and soft tissue infections that we um, documented. And this is one that we collected. Now, when I looked at this in our, um, in our models for inhibition of growth, it does not inhibit growth. So again, most people stopped at that point when it came to evaluation of antimicrobials. But we went an additional step and asked the question, okay, what other potential processes does this inter interact with? So we use this assay. It's a very simple crystal violet assay where basically you grow your organisms in your 96 well plate. Um, when they form a biofilm under certain media conditions, basically they'll form a layer at the bottom of the well. Other organisms will form, um, they will adhere to the kind of where the air liquid inter interface is, but the staph forms at the bottom and kind of around the sides. And so the question is, if we add these extracts um, to the wells, 
as they're trying to form the biofilm, can it stop them from forming? And indeed, we found that it did. And this is an image from a confocal laser scanning microscopy um, study where we have two different strains of staph. This is a hospital strain taken from an osteomyelitis patient, so it's a bone infection. And this is a strain of one of those more aggressive um, community-acquired infections found in bloodstreams of healthy, um, healthy individuals. This is a mutant that is basically does not form a biofilm. So when you add this, this is at different concentrations. 220-DF2 is our refined uh, version of the extract. It's enriched for content of elagic acid glycosides. And we'll get to why that's important in a moment. But you can see with dose response, at 100 micrograms per mil, there's basically no adhesion. This is a glass slide. Green shows growth or live cells. Red is dead cells. And a healthy biofilm is composed of live and dead cells, but they're just not adhering. And here you have it, 50 micrograms. There are some that are adhering, but not many. And at 12 micrograms, you can see that some of them are adhering. But if you look here, this is, um, a, this is a, a way of looking at it from the side view. So you can see the height of the towers. You can envision, again, those mushroom-shaped towers. What happens is, in the presence of the drug, they form these very tall, unstable towers. So if you think about it from the perspective of architecture, if you build a building too tall, what happens to it, <laughs> right? So it's, it's not as fit of a, of a structure. And so our next question is, you know, in the presence of these compounds, can we actually remove an established biofilm? That's the golden question, right? If you have an implanted device, let's say you have your knee replacement gets infected, currently the way that it's treated in the hospital is the physician's going to put you under high doses of antibiotics, they're going to go in and drain the pus because it's red and large and flamed and oozy and pus and infection. They're going to scrape it out or debride it. And then they have to remove the device, put in a temporary device that's embedded with antibiotics that will leach antibiotics into the area for a while, put you back on IV antibiotics. Then after it looks like you're healed, they'll come back in, take the temporary device out, put in a longer term device. Now for some of these um, procedures, the recurrence rate of infection is up to 40%. That, those are not good odds. That's our current standard of therapy. So if we had ways to actually prevent that biofilm from attaching in the first place, or actually treating a patient that has this kind of infection with something that eradicates or removes that biofilm without actually having to remove the whole device that's embedded in your bone, that would be great. So that's the question we asked here. Can we take these plant compounds and remove that goopy um, biofilm community from um, a device. So this is just a piece of IV catheter. So the same kind of IVs that go into your arm when you're in the hospital. We took one centimeter segments, grew the biofilm on it, and then treated it through a series of days in different media containing either just growth media, the biofilm inhibitor alone, antibiotic alone, or biofilm inhibitor plus antibiotic. Now we were disappointed to find that and blue is the biofilm control, and this is the biofilm inhibitor in orange, that we had no drop in adhered cells when treating with just the biofilm inhibitor, right? So it wasn't able to remove the established um, biofilm. But if you look at the antibiotic, this is 10 times the typical dose of daptomycin. It's 10 times the breakpoint MIC. You only had a very small, this is not even quite two log drop in adherent cells. But what got us excited is that when you combined the inhibitor plus the antibiotic, we saw a large five log drop in adhered cells. And this is after seven days of treatment. We didn't completely clear the biofilm, but this gives you a sense of how difficult these are to treat, right? This is why we have to actually remove the device. But this is bringing us steps closer to thinking about different ways to treat these kinds of infections. Now, within this mixture, this is a refined mixture, we knew that we had elagic acid and a bunch of these glycosidic um, forms of it. But we found that each time that we tried to separate the extract past that point of 220-DF2, we started losing activity. And so we recombined it in multiple different ways. We took our fractions and recombined fraction one and 10 and eight and 10 and all of them together in all these different myriad ways. And the only way we were able to restore the total activity of 220-DF2 is if we actually put the entire thing back together of 220-DF2. So this was a problem. <laughs> And um, for those of you that do any natural products isolation, you know that isolating enough of each individual compound from the extract can be very time consuming and difficult. So I went down the hill to chemistry. This is Dr. Um, Emily Weinert. And I said, you know, can you just make these for me? Because <laughs> I don't know how to do this. 
And she said, okay. I didn't realize at the time I was giving her a brick, right? Because elagic acid has serious solubility issues. But she was able to do this, and she actually generated a number of different glycosidic forms of the elagic acid. And what we found from this study was that the type of sugar did matter. We saw some enhanced um, activity with single compounds that had certain kinds of sugars. But what we found overall, again, is that that enriched botanical fraction that had a composition of many different elagic acid glycosides was still the most active. Um, so this was, I think, interesting and goes back again to this idea that I brought up before with artemisinin is, is actually this enriched um, composition better than going to a single drug in some cases. We also wanted to look and see what other organisms does this work against. So I did this in collaboration with Dr. Jorge Vidal, who's at um, Emory's um, School of Public Health. And he's, a, uh, he's an expert in um, streptococcus pneumoniae. And what we found with strep pneumoniae was very interesting is that in this case, 220DF2 actually did kill strep pneumoniae and it also broke up established biofilm. So that was really exciting that here it actually behaves differently. It's another gram positive caucus, but it behaves very differently than it does with Staph aureus. So there's some potential here um, also for other avenues of development for strep pneumonia um, infections. Now let's get back to community associated MRSA, and this is where my quorum sensing work I think really comes into play. So this is an epidemic I mentioned that really shocked the medical community and the public health officials because traditionally, again, staph was something that affected sick people or people that had implant devices. Then all of a sudden you started seeing football players, uh, military personnel. I'm talking about 19 year old men in the prime of health, very fit, very you know, immune stable, that were coming down with these really severe infections healthy one day and at death's door in a few days. I mean, really serious kinds of infections. They often would present as a skin infection in the ER. In fact, still staph um, skin infections are, are very common um, in the ER. If you, they're often confused by people as being spider bites. If you ever see this kind of circular um, infection that has a red hole in the middle, that's not a spider bite. It's often, it's, it's staph aureus um, kind of skin infection um, in, in most cases. And that hole is caused by these um, toxins that staph produces that, that ca can cause this necrotic lesion. So what they found is you had this, this, this severe sorts of infections were starting off in, with the skin and then moving um, systemically and infecting people. So what they did is they took these strains. Here's a classic um, study where they tried to replicate what they were seeing in the clinic. You had the hospital strain. Um, if you injected that into the bloodstream of the mouse, the mouse survived. Ma mice are actually quite good at fighting off staph. Um, if you took one of these new community-associated strains, you started to see deaths in mice within a, a very short amount of time. So there was something different that these bugs were doing. Again, this is not about drug resistance. This is about virulence. Um, staph exotoxins, which are part of that virulence package, are associated with a number of different diseases. Um, one of the classic ones is toxic shock syndrome. This was a big problem in, in a period where you had women um, using um, super absorbent um, tampons. Those were taken off the market for the long-term use because of this association. You have scalded skin syndrome and neonates. This actually um, is caused by exfoliative toxins that makes the baby's skin fall off. Extremely dangerous because, of course, you're removing that important immune barrier and can be opened up for additional secondary infections. And then the hallmark is abscesses, necrosis, and sepsis. And what's great about this from the ethnobotany perspective, again, is that people can describe this to me. They can tell me, I saw this on my skin. It was really gross. It felt like this. Or if it's a rash, it spread. It had fluid. The fluid was clear. The fluid was, was pustulant. You can get a lot of information from, from visual confirmation um, by people using plants for these kinds of indications. Now, what makes this kind of staff so um, potent is that it, it has this increased capacity to release toxins, and they actually use this, um, they use this capacity to recruit um, neutrophils and um, basically are gobbled up by the neutrophil. Once they're inside, they release a burst of toxin and actually actively attack your immune system. This is what makes them able to get into the bloodstream from these skin infections and spread throughout the body in a much more effective way than the other classic um, hospital-associated ones did. So when I was in um, doing my PhD work, there was a lot of talk by 
folks at NIH, like Michael Otto, had a lot of really interesting papers that were more opinion papers and kind of forward-thinking papers. What if we could come up with drugs to target this system of communication that controls virulence? And it was always the big what if. And there were people that were working on some peptide signaling agents and inhibitors. And I, at the time, of course, was working on these postulant wounds. And I'm thinking, well, maybe this is a way that could explain how some of these work um, in the clinic. And so I teamed up with Dr. Horswell, who's an expert in the accessory gene regulator system in staff, um, and he was able to build a number of tools that we use to assess these, um, these, these compounds. So the idea here is to use a quorum quenching approach. We're not actually killing the organism, but limiting its ability to communicate um, either through releasing signals or receiving signals. This is what the system looks like. So you have a, a, a constant release of these auto-inducing peptides into the cell's extracellular environment. And these are recognized here by AGRC. This triggers a phosphorylation event. And then downstream, you have a production of a number of different um, toxins, including superantigens, cytolysins, things that can burst open immune cells, red blood cells, degrade your tissue, um, and also help get past that skin barrier. This is really important um, for the skin barrier function. So in dermatology, we're always concerned with skin barrier function. If you lose that, that, that shield of your skin, if your skin barrier is degraded in any way, it opens you up for um, invasion by not only staph, but other pathogens or in the environment. It also opens you up to more um, contact with allergens um, in, in the environment. Um, so this is relevant for diseases also like eczema. I don't know if any of you are familiar with eczema. About 20% of kids in the U.S. and other developed countries deal with eczema or atopic dermatitis. And staph is heavily involved in that disease as well because of its role in impacting skin barrier function and causing itch through mast cell degranulation and histamine release. So let's go back to Italy again. Here's another case where we documented the use of chestnut. This is just your standard Castania sativa, um, standard chestnut grown across Europe for its fruits, um, for its edible fruits. And we had um, documentation of local people using the leaves of chestnut as an anti-inflammatory agent for um, inflammatory skin disease, um, much like what you would see in a classic eczema patient. And so again, we looked at this plant, found it did not inhibit the growth of bacteria. It doesn't really do much on biofilm, but it does inhibit this um, signaling um, system in Staph aureus. So by taking these, we um, basically, in some of these studies, we grew the bacteria in the presence of the plant extract, and then looked at the damage that the cell supernatant, this is basically the waste products of the bacteria, we put onto human cells. So the waste product would normally contain a lot of these toxins that are excreted from the cell. So if you put that onto a cell line, you're gonna see all of your cells are just gonna die and we're working with human skin cells. So those skin cells die. And the ones that were pre-treated though, with our extract, we found that they were protected because there's no toxin in that supernatant, right? Because you're turning off their ability to release toxin. So we wanted to see how this works in an animal. So in this model, you have, uh, this is a little mouse, sorry for any of you that get disturbed by animal images, <laughs> but here's a little mouse. We take one of those nasty community-associated MRSA strains that affects healthy people, inject it into the skin dermis, so it's an intradermal, intradermal injection, and you can see that after two days, this big necrotic lesion occurs. So by release of toxins, the staph is degrading the skin, okay? Now, we tried to then um, at the same time as we give the bacteria, we also give them a small dose of the chestnut extract. This is a refined extract, again, of ursine and oleanine derivatives, okay? And at five micrograms, you see a small, a much smaller lesion, but it still forms. And at 50 micrograms, there's no lesion formation. But you can see this little pocket, right? Remember, this is not an antibiotic. It's not actually killing the bugs. The bugs are still there but it's, you've just completely disarmed them. So it's a different way of thinking about how do you fight your enemy. I'm a big fan of Sun Tzu's Art of War, right? I think we need to think more about that when we think about how to better manage infectious disease. You know, can you disarm your enemy by, by other means? So the bacteria is still there, it just can't cause any damage, and in an immune competent organism, you can then clear out that infection, right? 
So let's go forward to another story. This is of Brazilian pepper tree. This is our more recent um, publication. And in Brazilian pepper tree, this is a plant that is Shinus terebinthifolia. It's in the Anacardiaceae. So this is um, a relative of mango and poison ivy. Very important in traditional medicine in um, South America. Um, especially in Brazilian medicine. And there's been a lot of records of many different ways it was used and a lot of different cases of infectious disease. Um, the fruits were understudied though, I found in the literature. And so we decided to go and collect some. Now luckily, I'm from this part of Florida. You can see why I'm not used to the cold. I'm from here, this is my, my county. I took some students down and we went and collected more of, um, of the, the fruits and leaves and different tissues of the plant because it's, a, it's an invasive species in Florida. It's a noxious weed. There are actually big programs that are geared towards removal of this plant. It's a hated plant, which is kind of, it's kind of an underdog story <laughs> for me. So in the, in the chemistry lab, we take that extract. We had a, a, a basic methanolic crude extract. We then undergo liquid liquid partitioning. These are basically just standard ways of separating compounds based on polarity. Um, then go to flash chromatography. And we can go on to prep or semi-prep and so on to isolate compounds. So you can see at each stage, here's the crude extract. As we enrich it or as we work on those more active parts, you can see um, you have um, greater concentration of these active compounds. So in our assays, I want to just show you a few examples. We have a reporter system. There are four types of signaling systems in staff of, or four different peptides that that AGR releases. So we have reporters for each of those. We wanted to control closely for growth, so we found it's not inhibiting growth in any of these reporters, but it is blocking their ability to signal or, or um, communicate between each other. Again, in our mouse model, we saw that you have your lesion with, um, at this case, we had 50 microgram injection, not as effective as a chestnut, but again, you see the same kind of activity of blocking that necrotic pathway. We also, for the first time, showed um, this in the live model using um, uh, fluorescent reporter strains in the live mouse that we are in the mouse also targeting this specific gene system to help prevent um, necrotic lesion formation. Now, <laughs> for those of you, this is, this is what we're working with. And this is a clean, <laughs> clean version of the extract. Um, plant extracts are, of course, incredibly chemically complex. And we're now focused on trying to isolate these individually through prep um, um, chromatography to then do more work to understand which of these compounds are involved. And again, thinking about this question of, do they work better together? One of my main concerns, if you go back to these four different AGR um, signaling peptides is, you know, it might, it might be that the mixture works better overall because it's very difficult. You're not going to have a, a, a physician AGR type your infection. They're going to say, is it staff or not? They're not going to go beyond that. So I think it could be advantageous to have a mixture that targets all four types. I think what else was interesting is that we showed that this does not inhibit growth of your skin commensals, right? So you, one of the challenges in antibiotic development is that while we're hitting these nasty bugs, at the same time, we're also killing all of your commensal organisms. This is why we have big issues with C. diff infections in the gut when you clear out your healthy um, commensal system. So we found in skin organisms, at least, with the exception of acne, um, this does um, not inhibit growth. Some of the different targets we're working on are, again, looking at, to atopic dermatitis, acute bacterial um, and skin and soft tissue infections. And I'm actually thinking more broadly now also towards veterinary medicine because um, atopic um, infections in dogs is actually also quite common. Um, so we're thinking about a doggy cream formulation for this as well as maybe a first place to start because the hurdles to getting this into a clinical study in dogs are much lower than going to humans as a first start starting place. Um, I want to talk just briefly about this one last um, um, uh, plant of St. John's wort. You've all probably heard of this. It's Hypericum perforatum. Um, it's used in the Balkans as a, in an interesting um, way. They actually create a sun um, oil infusion of the flowering aerial parts. So when you go to your standard um, health food store, you don't find that kind of formulation. You see they have organic um, extracts that are sold either in liquid or tablet form. Um, and again, mainly used for mental health rather than infectious disease. But what we documented in our studies over and over in the Balkans is that this um, particular formulation, it's locally known as Cantarion, is incredibly important for the treatment and management of skin disease. And one of my 
things I was worried about is that the presence of hypericin in the dietary supplement tablets can actually cause a disease called hypericism, um, which is a photoreactive skin disease. Basically, you, you're more um, susceptible to getting sunburned easily when you have um, this in your diet. So my question is, here we have these people that are rubbing this all over their skin all the time, and yet there were no reports of hypericism, there were no reports of skin photoreactivity. And so my question was, is it because they're formulating in a different way that they actually are at lower risk? Now, the major antibacterial compound here is hypericin, and hyperforin also has some antibacterial activity. This is the compound that causes that photoreactive um, side effect. So this was actually a study done by one of my undergraduates. I really love working with undergrads in the lab. I try and get students when they start as sophomores and they work with me all the way through senior year. So he's a, a co-first author on this paper. And what he did is he went and collect, got different tablets from supplement stores and then also worked with the plant materials that we collected in the Balkans, as well as the traditional formulation of this prepared in olive oil or in sunflower oil. And what we found is that when you look at growth inhibition, the tablets and supplements, and even the aqueous and methanol extracts were potently antibacterial, but they also had very high levels of hypericin, um, whereas the oils really didn't have much antibacterial activity. So again, traditional medicine, but is not killing staph or any of you know, these skin bacteria that cause this disease. So then we looked at quorum sensing. We saw it did have some moderate quorum quenching activity um, in the oils. So that might be one potential explanation for why this works so well. And when we looked at the chromatograms of uh, through mass spec, evaluating each of these formulations, what we found across the board, again, is that the oils lacked the presence of, um, of hypericin. So these are indeed lacking the toxic compound and not eliciting a standard antibacterial activity, but have some mild um, uh, anti-quorum sensing activity, as well as some mild anti-biofilm activity. I didn't show that data. So I'm gonna wrap up here and just say that, you know, I think that one of the things that we can do in the plant sciences is to think more broadly, also concerning, again, this idea of, of signaling in the, in the environment. Plants are signaling with organisms in their environment for their own survival, in some cases, um, we also have crossover with targets into human pathogens. And I think this is a, an interesting area to work. And I think, again, that traditional medicine can help us to focus in on those species that are most likely to have some kind of um, interference with, with the human pathogens. Um, our work, we also, I didn't get a chance to talk about the, our other targets. We also have some really cool projects on, ongoing right now with collaborators on Zika virus. We found a really potent inhibitor of replication for Zika. We're also working on some of these superbug fungus infections like um, Candida auris from some of our plants. So these are not yet published, but will be hopefully soon. And um, I just want to wrap up with, you know, can we look beyond these old paradigms of kill, kill, kill? I think that as we come to the end of the antibiotic era, we have to think about paradigm shifts in medicine and a role that some of these different, again, signaling inhibitors might play in managing disease in the future. So these are, that's where I'll end. And thank you, I don't know how far we've got for questions, but thanks. And we take some questions because you have. Sorry, it's probably a lot more microbiology than you guys were hoping for in a plant lecture. <laughs> so. I have a question actually. I was just thinking, uh, you know, you talk about having these compounds that are not really uh, killing the bacteria, so they, uh, but just quenching the virus of the bacteria. And do you think from the evolutionary point of view, do you think this will be maybe less strong to be resistant because they're less threatening? Also, yes, or? that's, I think, I think that's exactly right. I mean, there's, that's the other kind of thing that everyone wants is the resistance proof drug. Now, I think it depends on whether or not you have additional selective pressures at play. Um, perhaps resistance could evolve, but I think it's less likely than the direct selective pressures that we have with classic antibiotics. So we've actually done a lot of resistance studies with these drugs. We've done a lot of serial passaging, basically growing these in the presence of, of the quorum quenchers over generations and have not found any drop in um, their ability to quench um, signaling. Now, 
that was in the absence of an, of an additional selective pressure. So what would be optimal is if we could do this in an animal model. We've been thinking about ways to do this perhaps in Galeria melanella in the insect model. So we could then pass it through generations of insects. And that's something that we have on the, we have on the horizon. Have you seen any, or have you tried to see any synergistic effects of your combination of compounds from the different plants? So making a formula of different plants, we have not. Um, in your compounds that you know, some that affect biofilm, some that affect form sensing, and see if there's a synergistic effect. We haven't done that yet. We've focused mainly on um, combinations with existing antibiotics, but that could be a, an interesting thing to do. I guess my, the reason I haven't really done it is more from a translational perspective. It's already really difficult to get an IND going on these when you have, you know, through the botanical drug pathway. Um, for these, I think if I'm combining different extracts, that's not permissible under that pathway. Um, but from a kind of an inquiry standpoint, that could be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so Chinese has, has a lot of um, knowledge of I mean, I, I think that traditional Chinese medicine is incredibly complex and you can spend a lifetime studying it. In fact, people do. It's, um, I think there are a lot of interesting bioactive ingredients used in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, but to study it with the tools that we have today, you would need to really look at perhaps single plant tissues to start off with. Um, but in the future, as, as we advance kind of these different metabolomic approaches, perhaps there are better ways to study the complex mixtures. One of the problems with, uh, with, with some of these forms of medicine is, you know, are, if you're able to actually collect the fresh plant, as a botanist, I always like emphasize actual identification of the species. And so it, if you go into a traditional Chinese medicine shop, there are lots of dried bits of plants and roots and leaves. And I'm like, well, it's difficult to ensure that you have the correct species um, that you're working on, um, yeah. But I think it's a fascinating area. I'm like, I already deal in so much complexity though, the idea of working on ingredients that involve, you know, ingredients from five different species and different tissues into one formulation is just beyond my capacity to deal with right now. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.